Well, welcome to a jazzy beginning of Mini Medical School. I am Dr. Roseanne Berger. Uh, I am the Senior Associate Dean for Graduate Medical Education and the Director of the Mini Medical School. Mini Medical School for over 20 years has been translating science of medicine and healthcare uh, to a community audience of students of all ages and all backgrounds. Our aim is to improve healthcare, stimulate interest in healthcare as a potential career for some of our current students and share knowledge of our expert UB faculty members. Tonight is actually the perfect time for tonight's subject, which is everything you wanted to know about COVID and perhaps were afraid to ask. Here we are with vaccine arriving in our community and being administered really as we speak uh, to our first recipients of the vaccine. And we all feel very hopeful about that. Our experts tonight uh, are three, Tom Melendi, a professor of virology, who will provide background to help us really understand viruses and how vaccines can interrupt their spread. Dr. Fred Archer is a pediatrician uh, and an assistant professor of pediatrics uh, at uh, the Oshai Hospital. Um, he is a practicing pediatrician who has experience working on the east and the west side of Buffalo for the past 16 years. And lastly, uh, we have the second Tom, but first in our hearts, uh, Dr. Tom Russo, who is an infectious disease specialist who is well known to many of the many medical students who are attending this evening's class. Uh, Dr. Russo has been speaking on radio, television, and interviewed for the print press uh, about the pandemic. Uh, and has been called by some as our own Dr. Fauci. So um, we will begin uh, with a presentation by Dr. Melendi. Uh, after that, uh, Dr. Russo will give us a brief introduction and then we will be asking questions that we have accumulated uh, from those many medical students uh, during the registration process. There will also be an opportunity to ask questions uh, during the course of this session, which lasts for one hour. Uh, please use the Q&A icon, which is right next to the chat icon, if you do have questions. We will not be able to get to all of them this evening because this is a very evolving topic and lots of questions are certainly to arise. And for that reason, we are planning a second follow-up session in the new year. So don't worry if we don't get to your questions, we'll have another opportunity in the new year. So, Dr. Melendi. Thank you very much, Roseanne. Let's see. Where is my share screen? There's my share screen option. Okay, um, so hi, I'm uh, Dr. Melendi. I've been working on viruses for about 35 years and suddenly find myself in great demand this year. Um, but I'll tell you, I'm gonna try to tell you three different things during the course of this, just to briefly to say, I'm gonna talk to you about COVID-19 and how this pandemic compares to other pandemics through human history. You all hear pandemic, how does this one compare? Then I'm gonna, the virus that causes COVID-19, which is known as SARS-CoV-2, I'm going to give you a little outline about how it, as well as other coronaviruses, infect human cells to produce more virus so that we have a little, some basics on how that works. And then finally, I'm going to talk about how, uh, let's see, where do I find my spotlight? There we go. And then finally, I'm gonna talk about potential ways of attacking the SARS-CoV-2 virus and how it infects cells, both the general mechanism that's utilized by vaccine in utilizing vaccines, um, the general mechanism utilizing vaccines, as well as approaches for developing antiviral drugs. So coronaviruses in general, what are coronaviruses? They're called coronaviruses because of these unique structures 
um, which is actually, this is an electron micrograph of some, some coronaviruses. And here at the end is what, what we see is this, known as the spike protein. We'll talk about that again. And that's what the vaccines um, are, is the, spi are the viral spike protein. And it was named this because it, looks, it was thought by early people who were studying this virus to look like a crown or corona. So coronaviruses are respiratory pathogens and they infect both humans as well as um, other animals as well. And the common circulating human coronaviruses are those that we know of that cause colds. And these are the four most common names, the ones that primarily infect humans and don't cause serious disease, uh, but circulate through the population every year. In recent years, there have been several new, what we call zoonotic coronaviruses. And that is zoonotic because they come from animals. And over the past 20 years, these coronaviruses has crossed over from their animal host to infect humans. The first one was the original SARS, which arose in 2002. And this was a novel recombinant of a bat coronavirus and a civet cat coronavirus. And it probably occurred through co-infection in a civet cat. Then in 2012, um, the MERS coronavirus cropped up. And this was, again, a recombinant that appeared to have occurred between a bat coronavirus in a camel. The last one, which we're dealing with now, is COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2. And this appears to have occurred from a bat coronavirus co-infecting a pangolin or a spiny anteater. And this also created a novel coronavirus. But in this case, this is the first of these zoonotic coronaviruses to cause a broadly spread global pandemic. And we'll talk a little bit about why in a minute or two. Here are pandemics in human, the known pandemics in human history. And several things to, to look at in this. First of all, we are about nine months into the designated COVID-2 pandemic. And over this time, over the past six months, this has gone from being a minor pandemic to passing, in terms of the number of fatalities, all of these other historical pandemics. Until now, it's, it, in terms of the number of deaths, it is on, it's fifth in the history of pan, human pandemics. And interestingly, if you look at this, these, some of these pandemics are a little bit different in that this has occurred, these number of deaths have occurred over a relatively short period of time of nine months, whereas the HIV AIDS pandemic um, and the smallpox pandemic, for example, occurred over many, many years. In fact, COVID-19 has killed more people over a short period of time than anything other than the Black Plague from the Middle Ages, as well as the 1918-1919 influenza virus pandemic. So that tells you how serious this is. The other thing that I'll point out to you is that the most common type of disease that causes pandemics is influenza. You'll see there are several influenza pandemics. However, there are now, this is now the third coronavirus pandemic and all of them occur, have occurred in the last 20 years. Like influenza viruses, coronaviruses are respiratory. I'd already mentioned that to you. SARS-CoV-2 in comparison to influenzas are about two times more infectious than influenzas and are far more infectious than either SARS or MERS. And this is why it's creating a, a greater problem than SARS or MERS. Like influenza, SARS-CoV-2 can be transmitted in both pre-symptomatic as well as asymptomatic individuals. And this is the big reason why it spread so much uh, more dramatically than either the original SARS or MERS did. Interestingly, COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 lethality rate is only about one or 2%. I say only about one or 2%. Mind you, that's 10 or 20 times more um, lethal than a normal, a normal influenza pandemic. Conversely, SARS lethality rate is about 10%, so about 10 times higher this, and MERS is actually about 35%. So one of the things we have to keep in mind is that these novel zoonotic coronaviruses that seem to be arising over the last couple of decades are actually quite dangerous. And there is the potential of a novel zoonotic coronavirus arising if it had pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic transition, uh, transmission, but it had lethality rates similar to SARS or MERS, we could be dealing with a much greater crisis than we are now, like one of the worst crises and the worst pandemic crises in, in the history of mankind. So it's very important that we increase our studies of coronavirus and find better ways to prevent their inf infection or prevent uh, lethality when they infect us. 
Why is it more dangerous than circulating? Uh, why is this one more dangerous than circulating coronaviruses? We have no immu immunity to it in our population. So pretty much everybody um, is going to get infected until the, vac until the vaccine gets spread widely. Um, as I noted, it's more infectious than circulating coronaviruses as well as the other zoonotic coronaviruses. And that's because of a mutational change that cropped up in the major attachment protein, the spike protein, um, and it binds more strongly. And in addition, that binding is also affecting uh, the cells that it can infect. Up until now, the coronaviruses have primarily infected tracheal cells, lung cells, respiratory cells, but this new coronavirus actually infects blood endothelial cells um, very effectively. So as a result, we have increased complications you don't see with other coronaviruses like kidney issues, heart issues, strokes, blood clotting, um, even issues affecting brain function because the underlying blood vessels are being destroyed. So now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 life cycle. And this is gonna be kind of a long um, cartoon as I go through it. This is a cartoon of a human cell. This is the cell nucleus where our DNA is. And here's the cell membrane. Here are some of the trafficking intracellular. And what you can see is here's a depiction of the virus and the virus is coated by these little spike proteins, as I said, which is this mutation has created it to be much more um, infective. This spike protein binds to the ACE2 receptor, which is on the surface of several different cell types in our bodies, including lung cells, including blood endothelial cells. Once this um, binds, the virus gets internalized and the viral RNA gets uncoated. And here is just a cartoon depiction of what the viral um, RNA looks like. It's only about 30 kilobases long. It only encodes about 25 to 30 proteins. It's about 30 in this particular coronavirus. And it falls, um, and it's in the form of RNA. It falls into two parts. This terminal part are the structural proteins. That is predominantly the structure, the proteins that make up the structure of the virus. But this part, these called ORF, stand for open reading frames, are the viral proteins that act internally. And about half of them are structural, about half of them are internal. Interestingly, when this genomic gRNA gets into the cell, this part is recognized as if it were part of our normal mRNA. And of course, mRNA is the basis for vaccines. We may come back to that. But what happens is the cell recognizes this, and believes it's an mRNA and starts translating it with, the, with our ribosomes and ribosomes translate RNA into proteins. Interestingly, this part, these internal proteins are translated into what's called polyproteins. It's a whole bunch of proteins stuck together and they actually can't function that way. A number of RNA viruses do this. It may be for space reasons so they can express a lot of proteins in a small space, but these have to get cleaved up and to, so that they can form their individual proteins so they can fold and be functional correctly. And so the virus encodes a very specific viral protease or viral proteases that cleave these up into their individual parts and form the critical viral proteins that have to operate inside the cell. One of the most important cellular, I'm um, sorry, viral pro sets of proteins that are involved in the cell is this complex called the viral replicase. It's made up of three of these um, intracellular or what they call non-structural proteins. And it plays two very, very important roles within the virus. One thing it does is it goes over to this terminal part and it actually acts as a transcription, as if it's making RNA. And it makes what we is referred, they're referred to as subgenomic RNAs, but they're essentially messenger RNAs. And they encode some of these individual specific proteins. The S is the spike protein, and that's actually the mRNA protein that's utilized in the vaccines. These subgenomic RNAs are then translated by the host cell ribosomes, and the proteins are inserted into the endoplasmic retic retic reticulum to be transported through the cell. As I said, this viral replicase has two important functions. The other one is to replicate the viral genome so it can be packaged into new virus particles. And so this viral rep this replicase goes back and forth across this viral genome, creating more genomic RNAs, these go to the Golgi, where they bind to some of these viral structural proteins that are in the process of forming new viruses. New virus particles are formed in these vesicles, which transported to the cell, to the cell outer cell membrane and are released. 
Now we're picturing this as if one virus, but you have to imagine that each cell is producing thousands to millions of virus particles. So what can we do to stop this virus infection? Different sorts of antiviral targets. One mechanism is if we could stop this attachment of the spike protein to the ACE receptor, we could stop infection. And in fact, this is the gold standard for vaccines. It's what we call a neutralizing antibody because it, neutralize, because it neutralizes the ability of the virus to attach and get internalized. It turns out this is also the, this is also the target for two other things that we are using to treat um, COVID-19. And that is convalescent serum, as well as the Regeneron, Regeneron antibody cocktail. Both of these target the spike protein and prevent the virus from being taken up by cells. Vaccines are much better because once you're vaccinated, you have circulating antibodies and they will prevent the very earliest infection. In the case of convalescent serum and these antibody cocktail mixes, you're already infected and your cells are already producing lots of new virus particles. So these are helping, but they can't, but they're not really a wonderfully, tremendously effective treatment. Another way is to, another way of preventing viruses to try to attack some of these viral functions in a cell. And these are generally referred to as antivirals. And there are some effective targets of viral proteins that act in cells that have been identified in other viruses. Um, a couple of them are to inhibit the viral proteases, because if you stop the viral protease from cleaving this up, you'll never get the viral replicase, or a direct inhibitor of the viral replicase. And in fact, this is the only FDA approved antiviral drug is um, remdesivir, which is supposed to inhibit the viral replicase. Um, it was initially designed against replicase from a different virus. And unfortunately, clinical studies have now shown that it does not work particularly well. And we're actually desperately trying to find other sorts of inhibitors that could work in here. Not only would they be useful for the people for whom the vaccine does not work effectively or who foolishly choose to not get the vaccine, but such antivirals would be very likely, unlike a vaccine, they would be very likely to be useful against novel coronaviruses that crop up. So what are the approaches we use? What are the problems and difficulties with generating antivirals? If you start out from scratch and you start developing drugs that might inhibit a viral enzyme and doing preclinical studies and then doing uh, phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, it generally takes 15 to 20 years to bring a drug to market. And one of the major issues is whether or not this is effective in cells and whether or not it is effective and doesn't have deleterious effects um, on human beings. And that's what's usually so time consuming. So one of the possible advantages is to try to utilize an existing FDA approved drug, which has already been shown to go into cells and be, and be functional and to not be toxic to humans. So we actually collaborated with Dr. Samadrala, who's in the Department of Biomedical Informatics. And we published this paper uh, in July and he and his group has devel have developed a really great computational program that looks at the structure of drugs and the structure of proteins and predicts, pro and predicts drugs that might inhibit those proteins of interest. So he, particularly uh, Will and Zach, two, two uh, students and postdocs that work with him, they computationally screened over 2000 FDA approved drugs against the SARS coronavirus to proteome. And here's a figure from our paper. Um, and this just shows that some of the predicted drugs that, that are out there, including notice remdesivir is here, although it's ranking is a little low, it's down around 50. Um, so there are a number of drugs and they predicted they target various viral proteins. And interestingly, some of the viral proteins are just the ones we would like to be targeting. The RDRP is NSP12, it's part of viral replicase. NSP7 is part of the viral replicase. And this protein is that protease that's involved in cleaving these individual subunits so the replicase can function. So after publishing this, my group has gone in and just to give you one little slide of what we've been doing, we've been trying to develop a way of testing these drugs against this particular protease for example, and we created a novel biosensor to screen for these drugs against this protease. And we, we had never worked on coronaviruses before. In the past, we've always been working, uh, we've been working generally on HPV, which is a cancer-causing virus, but we had certain skills, um, which 
a way of looking at viral enzymes in the cells. And let's and we said, let's find a way to do that. So when the labs got emptied in March and April, uh, we all hunkered down, started working day and night and said, what can we do to find a way to address this problem? So we created this biosensor system for the protease. And essentially we plasmids that express the biosensor and the protease are transfected into human cells and they produce the proteins and we've proven this works and the protease cleaves this biosensor protein in two so that it doesn't work. And we put these in microplates and there's no, there's no biosensor. This is a fluorescence biosensor, nothing works. But what we've just recently shown in the last few weeks is if we take drugs that can inhibit this protease, new biosensor gets synthesized because these are because these are living cells, these two domains fuse together and this thing glows red. And what we now show is if we have drugs that inhibit this, we can actually see in wells of these wells glowing red cells. And that tells us that the inhibitor is working. The first inhibitor we tried, unfortunately it's at high levels and is a little too toxic, but now we're at the point where we're getting ready to start looking at some of the other compounds that uh, the, some of the other FDA approved drugs that we identified in our computational screen. We presented this a week and a half ago to the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, which is an in-house division of NIH. Um, and they are currently using translational science technologies to look for drugs to fight the pandemic. They liked our assay. They said it's a bit better than anything they've seen, including what they're currently using. Uh, and they're considering changing their platform to use this system. We are also in the midst of developing a similar cell-based system to screen for inhibitors of the replicase. So hopefully we can find some ways to try to develop, um, to try to develop, uh, to either find existing FDA approved drugs or in the future to find and develop new compounds that can be used against coronavirus infections for this pandemic and or for future pandemics. And my group is great. Like I said, they've been working day and night since April and we're all exhausted. And as you can see, I'm still here in my office late at night. I will stop sharing right now and answer any questions that you might be might have for me at this point in time. Who's handling the Q&A? So, um, Tom, thank you for, for sharing this and um, particularly for discussing the unique work that you're doing with currently approved drugs that can be uh, redeployed uh, to fight the virus. That, I think that's gosh. really exciting. Um, I was going to say there is one um, interesting question from the Q&A, uh, which is how do nanobodies isolated in llamas act to interfere with the virus infecting the cells? Um, that's an interesting question and kind of complicated. Um, so many of these viruses have been co-evolving with in animals with immune systems for millions of years. And some of these attachment proteins, including the spike protein that binds to the ACE2 receptor, there's usually a conformational change such, such that many of the antibodies are not neutralizing. Um, so neutralizing antibodies are what we look for. It's great when we can find those. But one of the tricks is the antibodies in some of these other animals like the camelids instead of, they actually utilize a smaller binding, a smaller piece of a protein for binding. And it actually can fit into smaller and tighter crevices and you have a higher probability of generating a neutralizing antibody, utilizing antibodies from camels and llamas. And so that's an interesting thing that's been investigated. And the idea might be is you wouldn't use it as a vaccine but you would use it in place of, for example, the Regeneron cocktail. Thank you. It's a great question. So Let's move to um, some questions uh, and the introduction to um, the vaccine uh, with Dr. Russo. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right, so uh, I just have a couple of slides and um, uh, thank you, Dr. Melendi, for a very nice overview of coronaviruses. So I'm not going to spend any time really on the epidemiology, the clinical syndromes, diagnosis, and treatment of the new coronavirus at this point, though if anyone has any pressing questions, we could go ahead and deal with that in the Q&A session. Um, the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is 
where are we at here in Erie County right now? And I'm sure you see this daily data. And this is Erie County data. It's actually as of yesterday. So I just updated this slide. And as you could see here in the upper left-hand corner, here are the new daily cases. So we had a tough run through October and most of November. But hopefully you could see now that we've got really a downward slope to the curve of new daily cases. And of course, the number of cases translates directly into the number of hospitalizations. And unfortunately, number of hospitalizations translate directly uh, in a certain proportion to the number of deaths. And then consistent with the downward curve of the cases, you could see we're heading in a good direction with hospitalizations. And these are daily new admissions here. And this is total hospital capacity here. There's gonna be a little bit more of a lag in total capacity because very sick patients are gonna be uh, stuck in hospital on ventilators and they're gonna be in hospital for a longer period of time. So a lot of you probably heard on, the, on Governor Cuomo's press conference, how important it is to maintain our capacity and how maybe here in Erie County, we weren't doing so well and we got to get on our game. I think these data show that actually we've done a really good job and we really didn't see a Thanksgiving bump that everyone was concerned about. Um, and so that's really quite encouraging. And I think people here are doing a great job following the public health measures that we're all too familiar with. Deaths, unfortunately, which lag in terms of new cases and hospitalizations are sort of bumping up in higher levels than we'd like to see. And, and it's going to take longer for that curve to come down with. And, and hopefully we continue to go in this good direction with decreasing new cases and decreasing hospitalizations, which will eventually translate into decreasing deaths. So you saw from Dr. Melendi sort of uh, a slide on the pandemics. I just wanted to, you know, kind of put in perspective um, really the significance of this pandemic. So this slide here, and I've left out a few uh, minor skirmishes that our country was involved in over the years, but you could see then these are battle related deaths. And you could see the numbers up here and the total battle related deaths, including, uh, as I said, uh, a, a few wars that are not listed in this slide is 651,000 plus. The Spanish flu, and these are US numbers, the estimated deaths were 675,000. Uh, and just to put things in perspective, 9-11, which was a horrific event, just under 3,000 deaths a day, which is essentially what we've been averaging over the last week or so with deaths from the uh, new coronavirus. To date, we're, we've unfortunately hit this milestone of greater than 300,000 deaths, and we are not done yet, unfortunately. Um, on a national basis, 0.1% of the population has died as a result of this pandemic. We're doing better here in Erie County. We have 592 deaths to date and 0.06%. So I'm not a big fan of militaristic analogies, uh, but in, in this war against COVID, we have finally, finally developed the weapon uh, that's going to enable us to go ahead and turn the tide. And of course, that's the vaccine. And as you know, the vaccine has been all over the news uh, the last few days. And so the first shots went into people. Let me just briefly talk about the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, both of which are RNA vaccines that Dr. Melendi nicely laid the foundation and how they work. And essentially these vaccines are the code for the spike protein. So we get injected with the RNA code, that code gets translated into spike protein and we make antibodies and a cellular response that protects us from infection. No one in their wildest imagination would have predicted that within uh, 11 months of uh, obtaining the RNA sequence of the new coronavirus, that we would be vaccinating individuals. And not only vaccinating individuals, but this vaccine has uh, you know, a point efficacy of 95% for both of them and an extraordinarily strong safety profile. And I'll just touch base a little bit on that uh, subsequently. Really, there's very little difference between these two RNA vaccines. The Pfizer vaccine was approved this last weekend, late on Saturday. The uh, uh, Moderna vaccine uh, has already gotten a thumbs up from the FDA review. Uh, it's going to go to the independent FDA advisory committee on Thursday. And if it gets a favorable review there, it's almost certainly going to be approved probably on Friday or this upcoming weekend. 
And I think it's worthwhile pointing out, though, that the time frame of vaccine development has been extraordinarily compact. The previous record was with mumps at four years. This is uh, really at about 11 months. There has not been any shortcuts in terms of the size of the trials and the analysis of the data. It's gone through its usual process of four independent committees uh, looking at this and uh, passing best judgment. And these committees really are comprised of really uh, career virologists, immunologists, vaccine specialists, and, and really some of the best uh, in the world. And so I think we can feel very comfortable that the review process has been rigorous and all our prior concerns about that it would be rushed have fortunately not been realized. There's now little difference between the two vaccines. Uh, the trials were designed to uh, show uh, preventing symptomatic infection. One small difference between the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine is there was 10 serious infections with the Pfizer vaccine. Nine of those were in the placebo group, one was in the vaccine group, so 90% efficacy, albeit small numbers in preventing serious infections. In the Moderna trial, there was 30 serious infections, all of them in the placebo group. So the numbers are small, uh, I don't know if that uh, small difference is going to pan out as we vaccinate more and more individuals, um, but perhaps just a, a minimal nod to the Moderna vaccine on that basis. Um, also, as all of you I'm sure have heard endlessly over the news and newspapers, the, the Pfizer vaccine has some logistical um, uh, issues with stability, so it needs to be stored at minus 70 and once thought it's only stable for five days at refrigerator temperature, whereas the Moderna vaccine is stable at normal freezer temperature and is stable for 30 days in a refrigerator. Uh, and so the Moderna vaccine obviously will have certain advantages where uh, minus uh, 80 freezers are not available and particularly in perhaps some um, countries and continents uh, where that would be even more problematic. Um, I just wanna briefly talk about safety because this comes up and I wanna to touch on really three points. First, um, whenever we get vaccinated, it's quite normal to have pain at the site. Some people have some redness, swelling, uh, occasionally even the development of a lymph node. And a smaller proportion of individuals will like have flu-like symptoms, myalgias, arthralgias, uh, chills, a sense of uh, fever. Uh, this is to be expected. This is the body's response to the vaccine. And when I get vaccinated with influenza uh, vaccine, I feel good when I, I feel some of these symptoms. Yeah, the vaccine's working. I'm developing some good antibodies, a good cellular response, and I'm going to have a nice degree of protection. Interestingly, in the Pfizer vaccine, uh, which is two doses, uh, the, the first dose went into people yesterday. Three weeks later, people get the second dose. Maximum protection will be about a week after that, so four weeks total. Um, people under 55 were more likely to get the systemic symptoms than older individuals. Um, the uh, other thing that's worth mentioning that, you know, has been out in social media is does this vaccine integrate into our chromosomes and cause mutations? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time of it. The short answer is no. The RNA is never uh, 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 sort of reverse transcribed into DNA. It's degraded in the cytoplasm. It never enters the nucleus. It's uh, an issue that uh, perhaps with some concern because this is a new platform and RNA sounds like something that's related to DNA, which it obviously is. Uh, uh, but that concern uh, is, is something that we do not have to worry about. The other thing that came up with the first vaccinations in the UK is a couple of people had uh, more serious allergic reactions. To put this in perspective, all vaccines, there's a small number of individuals that have more serious allergic reactions, some are on the order of one to a half a million to a million and people react to the components within the vaccine, which could actually be the components themselves or more commonly what the vaccine is solubilized in or stabilized in. Uh, we believe right now, and it's a work in progress, that polyethylene glycol, which is in both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, may be the constituent that uh, those individuals reacted to but that's in the process of being sorted out. It's really the only thing that's sort of reactogenic in this vaccine. The rest are lipids and RNA, which we naturally have in our body. So obviously we're gonna be sorting that out and get more information over time. But I think what this means is, if you're asking, well, should I get vaccinated if I have a history of allergic reactions? 
So if you have the usual allergies like seasonal allergies, you know, allergies to dust, uh, if you have food allergies, allergies to peanuts, allergies to other drugs such as penicillin, you do not have to be concerned about those types of allergies. At this point, uh, the best advice is if you've had a serious allergic reaction to a vaccination or any type of injection, at this point, it's best then to go ahead and discuss the nature of that vaccine and injection with your healthcare provider, gauge your relative risk. Um, the absolute contraindication, of course, is uh, allergic reaction to the new coronavirus vaccine, which almost no one has gotten. So that would be for people that had one on their first dose. They probably will not receive their second dose. And just to be reassured, when you're vaccinated, you're going to be observed um, for a certain amount of time. And if you do develop an allergic reaction, of course, we have treatment for that, depending on the severity of that, either anywhere from any histamines to EpiPens with epinephrine. Uh, so yeah. other than, Let me other than stop an, right there and uh, take any questions about this. Yes, Roseanne. Yes, it, you're you're talking about contraindications, and there was a question uh, about whether there were some other contraindications, such as patients who are immunosuppressed or have malignancies. Uh, sure. Would sure, these sure. be contraindications? So these are not contraindications. However, in the trials to date. Uh, we don't have any data on immunocompromised individuals. Um, it's not a contraindication, but it's possible that your immune response to the vaccine may not be as strong as it would be to uh, an individual with a healthy, normal immunologic system. The other area, the sort of special population, there's no data on pregnant women. There's no data on women that are nursing. Uh, Again, um, this is not an absolute contraindication, but it's something that needs to be discussed with your healthcare provider for an individual to assess the relative uh, risks and benefits and make a personal decision. Uh, lastly, the Pfizer vaccine has been approved for 16 years and up. Data on younger children will be forthcoming. The Moderna vaccine, if approved, will be for 18 years and up. They don't have any data on 16 and 17 year olds like the uh, Pfizer trial. Thanks. So, so we know that this disease has taken a toll on the elderly in particular. Um, and uh, we also know that the immune response is often um, blunted in elderly people. Uh, do you, can you comment on whether there is data on how these vaccines would work in the elderly population? So this is one of the many extraordinary pleasant surprises, as you know, Dr. Berger, uh, uh, these vaccines look great across all age groups. And the, of course, there was a lot of concern that people over 65 do not often respond as well to vaccines. For those of you that get flu vaccines, we know we have these high dose or adjuvant vaccines to help our immune system have a better response. Um, but these vaccines look fantastic, not only across all age groups, but across all ethnic groups. And both trials had significant uh, uh, um, enrollees in the trials that were uh, Hispanic, uh, African-American uh, origin. And so it lends confidence that it's gonna work uh, at least in uh, all of these uh, different age groups and ethnic backgrounds, which obviously is extraordinarily important. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and we do have confirmation from one of our geriatricians in the audience, Dr. Trone, who commented that the effectiveness is 94% for Pfizer and 86% for Moderna. Um, so the, another question related to um, the vaccination is if you have had the disease, if you were diagnosed with COVID-19, uh, developed antibodies, should you be vaccinated? The answer is gonna be yes. At this point, uh, if you've been infected with the new coronavirus, um, the advice is to wait at least three months and that's mostly to get sort of to the back of the line in your priority group. So those individuals that have never been infected will have the first opportunity. And this is really based on two things. There was about a thousand people in the Pfizer trial um, in the vaccine arm that retrospectively had antibodies suggesting prior infection, and they had no adverse reactions with vaccination. We also know that we're not certain how many individuals will, from natural infection will be at risk for getting reinfection, um, but there's already at least 25 well-documented cases and likely many, many more. And we don't know how durable 
uh, you know, natural immunity, immunity from natural infection will be. So if you get vaccinated with uh, these new vaccines, even if you've had prior infection, you're probably going to get a tremendous boost and even have a better level of protection than someone that uh, did not have prior infection. So I, I think those individuals are going to get a green light with the initial caveat that there's going to be a little bit of a time lag in terms of these 90 days since you were infected uh, to give with the vaccine not being broadly available at this point for everyone uh, to give the uninfected individuals an opportunity. There was another question about the order of vaccines. In other words, if, uh, if you, um, is there any order that should, uh, the vaccine should be administered in, uh, in relationship to flu vaccine or any other standard immunizations? Does one have to be happen, happen prior to the other one? So the answer is no, but we of course know that everyone in Erie County has already gotten their flu vaccine, uh, Dr. Berger, so we don't have to worry about that, right? And uh, I got mine. <laughs> right. And so the other question that comes up, if you get a first shot from Pfizer, can you get a second shot from Moderna? And the answer is no at this point. You want to stay within, uh, you know, the vaccine formulation that you received for both shots, you know. People have also anticipated, okay, well, what, how long is this going to last? We don't know. We're hoping it's going to last. Uh, at least a few years, keeping in mind that coronaviruses do not mutate that readily. Uh, and part of the reason we get annual flu vaccines is because they endogenically change all the time through uh, uh, reassortment. Uh, and so uh, the vaccine that you received the year before is less likely to be efficacious as the virus is continually changing. We don't think that's gonna occur with the coronavirus uh, as readily, but we're gonna have to see as well. And so once you're vaccinated, there's been a number of questions about whether it's necessary to continue social distancing and masking. Uh, thank you, Dr. Berger, for <laughs> teaming up on that one. So hot off the press, and this is why I didn't prepare any slides, is because the data from the Moderna trial suggests, so both the Pfizer and the Moderna trial, their primary outcomes was developing the symptomatic disease. But Moderna released some data about uh, those individuals that vaccinated, would you have what we call sterilizing immunity? So that if you, uh, if you were uh, then exposed to the virus, the virus would, the vaccine would protect you and the virus could not replicate and you would never produce infectious particles that could, uh, infectious particles that can infect other individuals. Or could you develop asymptomatic infection, which is actually quite prevalent with uh, natural coronavirus infection, where you wouldn't have any symptoms because you were vaccinated, but you could potentially produce infectious particles and infect others. And we know the vaccine is not perfect. So there'll be a small percentage of individuals that actually may develop symptomatic infection. The Moderna vaccine data that was released and, uh, and presented to the FDA as an addentum, I believe yesterday, um, showed that they decreased the number of these asymptomatic infections by about two thirds. So not perfect, not 100% sterilizing immunity, but you know that's encouraging. However, we don't know about the Pfizer vaccine yet. And since not everyone with the Moderna vaccine, and I'm anticipating approval, will have sterilizing immunity, though we're hoping that those that don't, maybe they'll be significantly less infectious. Uh, until we know more about this, the recommendation is to be to can carry on with those public health measures, keep wearing that mask, keep wearing, doing the distancing, do not engage in risky behaviors indoors without masks, et cetera. And keep in mind, it's going to take us probably about four to five months that hopefully we'll have a significant degree of acceptance where we could get 70 to 80 percent of the population immunized and achieve herd immunity. Between now and then, the only tool we have to keep new infections and new cases down is those public health measures until we could get enough vaccine in individuals. Well, thank you. That's, that's hopeful. That's very hopeful. Can I ask mm -hmm. a question of Dr. Russo? Please do. You were talking, uh, uh, when you're talking about colds in terms of the persistence of the protection by the vaccine, people get infected with colds repeatedly, sometimes every two or three years. What are the current projections that you've heard in terms of the longevity? As you pointed out, the coronaviruses don't change as rapidly as influenza viruses. When we, that's why we get yearly, yearly injections for the flu vaccine. But do you think that we're going to have persistent long immunity against the coronavirus? Well, we don't know, Tom. We know for sure that we have neutralizing antibodies now for at least six plus months. 
So that's the only data that we have now. And that is from natural infection. So we're hoping that with vaccination and certainly some of these individuals are gonna get a large boost because they've had prior infection that easy to recognize or unrecognized that we're gonna get more mileage out of this. But we're just gonna to have to see and uh, we'll have to follow this closely, determine when we start getting waning immunity. Um, we're hoping for at least a couple of years, but we don't know. And then the other issue is does the virus, even though it's a slow mutator, Will there be an antigenic shift to the degree where the vaccine will be um, less efficacious? But you know, the great thing about these RNA platforms is these vaccines, are, they're synthesized. And all you need is that sequence. And very quickly, you could go ahead and design the code that you think is going to be effective. I think it was from sequence to you know, uh, designing the code and doing phase one was a very short period for this virus for Moderna. It's like six weeks or something. So it's a very agile platform. So if we need to be vaccinated individuals, even with a different vaccine, because there's some uh, antigenic shift, uh, then I think you know we've the learning curve now we've overcome the huge hurdle in terms of getting this first RNA vaccine under our belts that looks uh, both efficacious and safe. And I, I think this is just going to open the door for not only if needed additional vaccines for the new coronaviruses, but now we're going to be taking a look at this for a wide variety of not only infections, but actually other diseases as well. And this is beyond the scope of this where these types of vaccines could uh, be used for both actually treatments. Dr. Melendi will be getting grants for years and years to come for his lab, <laughs> for sure. From your lips. Uh, yes. <laughs> Lots of work to be done. So I'd like to turn um, to Dr. Archer for a moment. There have been a number of questions that are related to children and pediatrics. Um, and uh, one came from someone who commented how long schools have been closed in North Carolina. And the concerns are, about the impact on of the um, school change in school format on a child development and learning and how to address the concern of parents. There are others very practical questions about um, what should a parent do when a child is uh, in class in school and then comes home? How can they, uh, how can the parents protect the rest of the family um, when someone is in school and they don't know what their exposure has been? And should there be any special testing that goes along um, with children who are in these um, hybrid uh, models of, of education? So no pressure, uh, not, nothing <laughs> like uh, easily answered, easily answered. Uh, um, and, and first off, thank you for allowing me to be included in this discussion. Um, a lot of times, you know, as a pediatrician, you feel that the kids are just left out, but we know that this affects everybody from the, from the old to the young. Um, it's irrespective of race, gender, uh, socioeconomic status. So making sure that kids are being paid attention to is important. So thank you for allowing me to participate. With these fine other individuals here, these folks are doing some really impressive work. It's, uh, so it's uh, very, it, this is good information. I'm glad this is actually getting out there to everybody. Uh, with respect to when you're looking at uh, parents and school safety, that, that's the big thing with, with everyone. And we've all seen lots of the data now where not every kid learns the same way as every other child. So coming up with a model that works best for your child is A, you knowing your child and B, you understanding and having a good relationship with your school system. And so I always encourage every parent to talk with the schools and know, understand what's going on from that standpoint. We have seen, and there's been far too much information out there just from, you know, in the popular media and the press about just the educational impact on children. If kids aren't necessarily getting that in-person learning, you know, we're seeing that they're not retaining as much and that the retention factor is lower, their ability to kind of focus sometimes goes off. And again, going back to that initial thing I said, not every kid learns the same way. There are some children, you sit them in front of a computer and they are fine. Other kids, you put them in front of a computer and they're like, why am I not playing Roblox right now? This does not make me happy. So it's really about working with that school and coming up with a plan that works best, not just for the school district, but for the, your child as well. And, that, and I always encourage every parent to be an advocate for their child. So we do know that a lot of schools, you know, they do their plans based upon the district or, or a larger, or for a city, for example. And I like the fact that as this was all going on, parents are able to weigh in with the school district and make their voices be heard about that. But taking that into account was the one thing that I always liked that came through from the American Academy of Pediatric Statement. It's they definitely encourage kids to go back from a learning standpoint and from a socialization standpoint, because otherwise we're only going to be able to learn how to talk through Zoom and that's not good for anybody. Uh, 
but at the same time, we need to make sure that's a safe environment. And so what does safety really mean from a parental standpoint uh, with respect to their children? We would love to wrap them all up in bubble wrap, but that's not effective for anybody and can cause some chafing. So we don't want to do that on a routine basis. But when we talk about safety from a kid's standpoint, one thing that we always talk about is how is this spread? So we know that it's aerosolized spread, it's spread by sneezing, it's spread by you know, droplets going into the air. And we do know that the average adult can push that around six feet or farther. Kids don't cough or sneeze as far as adults. It's just a matter of physics. It's not that their lungs are bad or wrong, they're just smaller. They cannot generate that much force. So when you start looking at the initial data, you weren't seeing kids catching it nearly as much as they would, as you would see about a group of adults. The problem is they still can spread it because as we know, children do, they're gonna to touch and they're not necessarily gonna be routinely washing their hands all the time. So a lot of it goes back to these common sense things that we all should have learned in kindergarten. Wash your hands, okay? Sneeze into your sleeve. You know, if, if you're, you know, if it's Halloween, do the vampire motion. If it's Buffalo, you do the chicken wing. Had to put that out there. But decreasing the, finding ways to decrease the droplet spread that you can. So we, I love that there was a huge push and a huge effort for kids to learn how to wash their hands. And I know there's a push on sanitizer to the point where you could not find any on any shelf anywhere. Soap and water works fine. <laughs> so it's a matter of some of these just common sense methods that actually work well. And, and the key thing is, can we get that done within a classroom setting? And we all know as parents, a lot of times we'll say something to a kid, they're going to ignore you. When the teacher says it, that is gospel. So getting a lot of teachers on board with reminding the kids, okay, everyone, let's wash our hands. Let's do that. Okay, everyone, make sure we have our mask on and make it fun with the kids. I had a kid come into our clinic, uh, which we've also changed our models on, decrease the amount of folks we have coming in just to decrease um, personnel, decrease the amount of spread. And the kid had a mask on that said Wednesday. And we all remember having uh, certain articles of clothing that we'd wear for certain days of the week. And this mom had gotten creative and the kid had a mask for every day of the week and they knew what label it was based upon what was on there. Make it fun for the kids. If you can make it fun, it's no longer scary. All right. I would be wearing my Batman mask right now, but then you wouldn't be able to see me talk. The other thing we talk about is spacing. So we've all talked about the six foot rule, the six foot rule, putting everyone in like a little plexiglass, you know, uh, cubicle of some kind. And that is one thing that actually starts to open up. And I don't mean to kind of go off topic a little bit, but we talk about healthcare disparities. And we know that's a buzzword for everything nowadays. And one thing this virus really has done is opened up the disparities that are evident in our society, at least in contemporary American society right now. And different school systems have different resources. That's completely an, uh, an honest and open thing there. And so if you've got a school district that can afford to have smaller classroom sizes, we don't need to have 30 kids in a classroom. We can have 14, we can have 11. I can distance those kids appropriately. That allows for that, that school district to decrease infectivity and spread amongst the children, amongst the teachers, amongst the faculty, amongst the staff. If you have a school district that just doesn't even have the facilities to do that, then we run into an issue of creating a factory where we're just gonna be building more spread. So it behooves us to actually really look at these disparities to see how we can help different populations decrease risk and spread. We can look at Native American population, Hispanic population, African American population. And, this, and it's less about the ethnicity and really more about the socioeconomics. That's another disparity that we have to pay attention to. So- I'm glad I wanted to, I oh, wanted to zero in on that healthcare disparities issue. So thank you for bringing it up. Um, we know that this really has shown a spotlight on the healthcare disparities. And um, we also know that there is a lack of trust um, in many populations for good reason. Uh, lack of trust in the science, in scientists, lack of trust, trust in the healthcare system. You as a pediatrician um, are dealing with the issue of vaccinations all the time and, and needing to respond to concerns that people have about vaccinations. Are there any lessons that you have learned about convincing uh, or demonstrating the importance of vaccinations to people who are skeptical that we could actually translate to the rest of our population that may be hesitant to get the COVID-19 vaccine? That is a great, great, great question. As a pediatrician, uh, you know, pediatricians and vaccines are like this. That's what we do a lot. So when Dr. Russo was discussing the possible side effects, we're like, yeah, that's, that's, we do that every day. 
the biggest thing is trust and transparency and showing people who, and what, and this would be a great thing. I know that you've seen some of this on television, on videos, showing the folks who are doing the research, showing the folks in the lab that are actually doing this, showing the doctors and nurses that are involved in administering the vaccinations, showing people getting the vaccinations and making sure it looks like the people you want to get the vaccination. Spending time, as a pediatrician, we develop a bond with our families. You know, that's one reason why, why we like doing this. You love just that process of watching that child grow up into a, 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 a from a baby to a kid, to a surly teen, to a responsible teen. <laughs> and once you have that bond and relationship, you can then, I don't like to use a term, it's not about convincing people, but it's about being honest and upfront with them. So when we, we routinely have families that have questions about vaccinations. And so I always tell them, let's talk, let's sit down. I'll you know, get out a computer, get out a book. Let's go to the website together. You've read some things. Well, let's talk about what you read. And so we can find appropriate common ground to work with. I always like to talk about what resources are you using? What resources am I using? It's one thing to, you know, I found an article I found on Facebook last weekend. That's not research. That's an article I read on Facebook last weekend. Where did you get that information? Let's actually talk about that. And we can, and there's definitely has been a history of distrust from multiple groups um, over the course of, you know, centuries, really. And, with, and so that breeds good reason for folks to be skeptical. And that's why I'm glad there's a concerted effort amongst multiple branches of medicine, amongst multiple disciplines and multiple, you know, for lack of a better term, ethnicities to say, look, we're all involved in this. We're all doing the research on this. We're all getting this to make it transparent, to let everyone know how safe and effective it is. And you know, it's for some people, you just have to say the word Tuskegee and you're not just thinking about fighter planes, you're thinking about the Tuskegee experiment, which was a travesty. And I'm glad that people talk about it because that shows that we're learning. One thing that's been frustrating about COVID for this entire process for the, the non-medical person is why don't we have an answer yet? Why do you guys have all the science? Why aren't you getting the answers? Because people are actually watching us do this in real time. And it's just, and I can imagine, it's frustrating for us as healthcare professionals. It's doubly frustrating for someone who's not. You know, if my kid's got a sore throat, I walk in, I get a swab, you got strep, here's your amoxicillin, bye-bye. And we've had that figured out for decades. This we've had figured out for months. So I, and this has been the most tr transparent process of any kind of development I've ever seen in my entire medical career. And so it's impressive to me that we're getting the word out like we are that people have the chance to ask questions and try and actually try to get real answers. And you've got, you know, I love the fact that you've got two experts, you know, doing real hardcore research on here. You know, I'm a simple country pediatrician. You know, my job is to talk to you and make sure your kids don't have a snotty nose and they wear their mask and that they sit, you know, try to sit six feet apart. When you're going on a bus with people, don't sit around everyone. When you're in the middle of Walmart, you know, little trick that I use, put the cart behind you. You've suddenly got six feet of room behind you. Okay, then you also, you create six feet in front of you, boom, you've now got your barrier. Thank so, you. For, and and thank I'm sorry for these, off topic a little bit there, people. I, I get kind of impassioned about these things, especially when we're involving kids. Uh, but we I know think these tips, these tips are very important. And, and one of the themes that I heard in, in your approach to skeptical um, skepticism about vaccines is that you listen. You listen to find out what the concerns are, as opposed to just lecturing and giving facts. So I think that's a wonderful, wonderful message to convey. You have, you have to listen. And it's something I try to teach my students and residents, because A, all the information you're getting comes from listening. And the other thing is when you have folks that are hesitant with a vaccination, you know, oh, my grandmother got the flu and she got really sick. You know, we know all the data, we're scientists. We know that you didn't actually get the flu. This is your body mounting an immune response. This is a good thing. But for that person, that's their lived experience. I cannot challenge someone else's lived experience. I can exp explain what happened to them through the filter of the science and let them know that this is what is going on here. But I'm not gonna try and change your lived experience, but I wanna give you some knowledge so you can understand your lived experience, maybe with some more nuance. It does nobody any good to just dismiss people out of hand you're gonna get more resistance that way. And if you actually sit down and listen to folks, they're gonna be more open and honest. And I, I do have to take one, one tiny point of privilege and, and say hello back to uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Michael Stratemeyer, who put that question out there. Uh, it's good to hear from you, my friend. I'm glad you're doing well. <laughs> so thank you. I think, I think this um, 
gives us a mission to go out and listen and to educate, uh, to continue to wear our masks uh, and to uh, get vaccinated when we have the, the opportunity. I know that there are many questions that people had. Um, we are going to post the recording of this session uh, on our mini med school page um, that could be accessed by going to medicine.buffalo.edu. Um, and we will also look at many of the questions that were posted in the Q&A and put some of those answers on that webpage as well. As I promised, we will be um, having another session because this is a fluid situation. There'll be so much more to discuss in the new year. Um, I just would like to uh, say in parting that, um, Jen, if you wanna share our image, um, our residents, uh, when they started, you know, we have a group of residents and medical students who had a very unusual experience um, for uh, in, during the past year. Uh, and when our new class of residents arrived here, they all were photographed wearing masks that were made by community members. So we were very grateful to those community members. And we are now using this as a reminder that when you mask up, um, you are helping each other and the members of our community and our healthcare workers who are working so hard for us. And uh, speaking of healthcare workers, uh, I also want to thank our sponsors, um, UBMD, and a number of people who have been very generous in donating to Mini Medical School so we can continue these programs hopefully, uh, at perhaps as Dr. Russo hinted, in, in person sometime in late 2021. Um, so if we can now look at our um, message. Wellness Wednesday is brought to you by UBMD Physicians Group. There's no doubt that the holidays are an exciting yet busy time of the year. Though the holidays may be looking a little bit different this year, this gives us an opportunity to practice some self-care techniques through our health practices. Staying active throughout the holidays will help us keep feeling our best. Whether it's bundling up to take a walk with your dog or a family member, raking up some last minute leaves or shoveling snow, or even getting in a home workout, there are plenty of ways to get our body moving. This will help aid in regular digestion, assisting in stress management, as well as a boost of energy. As far as the food goes, I really encourage people to focus on the plate method. This involves you making a quarter of your plate carbohydrates, preferably whole grains, a quarter of your plate proteins, and half of your plate focusing on color, which are your fruits and vegetables. And lastly, try not to skip meals. Often skipping meals leaves us very hungry going into that meal, and it can be really hard to control our portions. When it's hard to control our portions, we tend to overeat and are left feeling very uncomfortable. Happy holidays. Uh, hope to see you in the new year, virtually or in person. And thank you for joining us for this session of Mini Med. Thank you to all our speakers. Uh, I really appreciate your expertise and your time and um, your generosity. So thank you and good night.